Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer and then we can get, get started. Father, thank you for your, for your Word. Thank you, Lord, for the ability and the freedom that we have in this nation to come before you and worship you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now, Lord, as we go into this, this, this topic, which is so prevalent in our lives, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us here this day in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. All right. Well, the message today is entitled, Knowing the Will of God. And we're going to be taking a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 33, and then also Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 40. But I encourage you just to go to Judges for now, because I'm going to put the first passage up on the, the screen. We've been working our way through the, the book of Hebrews, and we've come into chapter 11, which is that chapter that we call the, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And as we work our way through there, we're, we're seeing several of the individuals that are listed in there and examining why it is that they're there. Now, for me, one of the encouraging things is that we see that, that all of these individuals had challenges. These individuals had doubts. They had different things that they had to go through, like, like you and myself, in our everyday life. And so we're going to take a look at them one by one and see what it was and how we can apply that to our lives. Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, I'm just going to pick it up where we left off here. But it says, in, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the, of the sword. And then here we go. Out of weakness were made strong became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. As we come to this individual by the name of, of, of Gideon, it's interesting to note that Gideon's name means warrior. But at this particular point in his life, I'm sure he didn't feel very much like a warrior. In fact, he was pretty frightened. Now, we're going to find that Gideon is the fifth of 14 judges in the book of Judges. He's, uh, just a few of them are involved here. We've got four of them uh, from the heroes of the faith that are listed in this chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, that we'll be taking a look at. I've got to tell you, the one I've always dreaded teaching on is Jeff, uh, Japheth. <laughs> and we're getting there one of these days. That'll be a, an interesting lesson when we get to that point here. But today we see the radical transformation that took place in Gideon's life. We see him going from a frightened young man to a mighty man of valor. Warren Worsby put it this way, he said, More space is devoted to Gideon in the book of Judges, 100 verses, than to any other judge. And Gideon is the only judge whose personal struggles with his faith are recorded. Gideon is a, a great encouragement to people who have a hard time accepting themselves and believing that God can make anything out of them or do anything good from them. Isn't it interesting that so many of us get to the point where we, we wonder if God can ever use us? And I'm sure that Gideon was in the same place. I mean, he saw his weaknesses. He saw the strength of the enemy. And yet we find that God called him to come out of the crowd and to lead the way. And I wonder how many of you, God has put a call on your life to do something, maybe in ministry or something else. And because of fear, you have stepped back. Because of fear, you didn't go forward and do what God called you to do. Do you realize that when that happens, when we let fear take over, that we miss the blessings that God would have on our lives? And so I, I encourage you today as, as we look here, there, there may be somebody here today who as you come, you're wrestling with that very question, you know, God, what is your will for my life? 
what do you want me to do in this particular circumstance? And so as we go through some of these principles, I'm hoping and praying that they'll be of help to you in the decisions in which you need to make with your life. Well, let's open our Bibles to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to begin, uh, begin with verses 1 and read through 2a. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed over them, over Israel. Uh, do you remember last week we were taking a look and we saw the number seven coming up again and again? And we're going to see that number seven in here again. And in biblical numerology, the number seven would, would, would mean perfection. It, it would mean completion. Something was being complete. And the Israelites, because of the evil in which they had done, they had, uh, had the, the Midianites coming after them now and, 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 and just bringing them to destitute, to be destitute for seven years at this point. The year here was somewhere in the area of 1170 BC. But throughout the book of Judges, we see this vicious cycle that keeps happening again and again and again. In fact, as we see the cycle, what, what happens is we see that the nation will always begin with apostasy. They're going to turn away from the Lord. Even with all of the blessings of God, they turn their back on God, which leads to a foreign country coming in and servitude. They, they end up going into servitude to this country, which leads the people to finally repent, finally get to that breaking point in which they begin to pray. They begin with supplication to ask God to intervene. And then God in his grace and his mercy does, and he brings a judge, he brings salvation, spares the nation, and then we go right back into the apostasy again. You want to take a guess how many times that happens in the book of Judges? Anybody? Seven times, that's right. <laughs> Seven times that happens in the book of Judges, and we see that happening over and over again. Well, in this particular case, for seven years, God had allowed Midian to punish the Israelites because of the sin in which they, they had done. Now, the Midianites were from the Arabian Peninsula, which is east of the Sinai Peninsula. They were descendants of Abraham and Keturah, if you remember back in Genesis chapter 25. And I put a, a, a map up here just to give you an idea because we hear about these different regions, but we wonder exactly where are they in the world today? And if we were to look at that area of Midian, what would you say? What, what country is Midian in today? Anybody recognize that? Saudi Arabia. That's right. And so the, the Midianites, or those from Saudi Arabia, joined together with other, other people groups that were enemies of Israel, and they would come all the way up, and they would raid, and then they would leave and go back. The time of the year they would come up is when all the food was ready, when they could grab whatever they needed. Now, we first see the Midianites in the Bible when it comes to Moses. Moses' father-in-law was a Midianite, and he was a good Midianite, and he helped the Israelites. But later on, things began to, to change. We end up seeing that, uh, well, let me back up. That wasn't the first time. That's later on. In fact, even before that, what we see is that the Midianites bought Joseph from his brothers, and they ended up selling him to Potiphar in Egypt. We see that the Midianites hired Balaam to curse the Israelites in Numbers chapter 22. And now we see that they, they looted Israel, they stole the food, and they had brought them almost to the point of salvation. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. He said, the Lord does not permit his children to sin successfully. And I say that again because that really applies to our lives. The Lord does not permit his children to sin successfully. In fact, whenever we walk away from the Lord, you can expect difficulties to come in your life. You see, because if you're a child of God and God loves you, then he's going to chastise you when you turn your back on him. Why? Because it's best for you to be right with God and he wants you to come back into a right relationship. And so he loves you enough, and maybe some of you today are going through difficulties because you've walked away from the Lord, or the consequences of doing that. God does that because he wants you to come back to him. He disciplines us with a purpose, and we find in Scripture that that purpose is that we might yield the fruit of righteousness within our life. That big word, churchianity word, righteousness, simply to do what is right in the eyes of God. Well, verse 2b says, Because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made for themselves dens and caves and the strongholds 
which are in the mountains. We get an idea here of just how desperate the situation was as the Bible describes what happened to the Israelites. These, the, the, this group of marauders would come up into the area and they were so vicious and there were so many of them that the only way that the Israelites could survive is they would leave everything they had behind. They'd go up in the mountains and they'd look for a den. They'd look for a cave. Caves aren't the way we normally live, are, are they? And so you can see that they were doing anything that they could to hide from, from these people as they came up just so that they could survive. Verses 3 through 5, we get an idea of just how big this group was. So it was whenever Israel had sown, in, in other words, whenever the crop was ready to be taken, the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites, the people of the east, would all come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel. Neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkeys, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming as numerous as the locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. We kind of get an idea here of what was going on, and you saw on the map how far they would come. And they'd come up, and they would, uh, the Midianites would come up, and they would form a coalition of nations that hated the nation of Israel. That sound familiar today, even? The, who hated the nations of Israel, and they would come against them. And uh, they, they, they over, they, it was so bad, they not only took their food, they took their animals. They had nothing that was left. And the description here is that the people were like locusts. In the Bible, we see locusts being used of invading armies as they come in. And you see locusts come in, they take everything. And that's the imagery that we have right here of these nations that were coming against Israel. But verse 5 gives us even more detail as to what was happening. This is the first mention of camels being used in military warfare within the Bible. You think, well, big deal. So you got a camel. What's the difference on there? Well, camels brought speed. Camels brought mobility. When you're out in a desert region like Israel is in the back country where Jordan is today and down by Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of sand that you're not going to find too many horses traveling on. But camels can. In fact, camels can travel great distances each and every day. One of the things Cheryl and I have always liked to do here on the Oregon coast when we get a day off is we go for a drive. And maybe many of you are, are the same. Um, <laughs> We go north, we go south. There's not too many ways to go unless we go, go, go to the east a little bit. But uh, I never get tired of seeing the Oregon coast. But one thing I've noticed. Have you noticed that about every 20 miles, there's a town? Have you noticed that as you're driving up and down the coast? Do you know why there is a town every 20 miles? Because in the old days, a horse and wagon could travel about 20 miles. And that was it. And so every 20 miles, they ended up having a town. And that gives you the, an idea of the difficulty of traveling. But with this new tactical weapon of camels, camels were able to travel 100 miles a day. Can you imagine that? So these troops could get on their camels, they could go great distances, they could come in, they could raid everything that the people had and head back quickly and get out of the scene. And it totally changed the warfare. So the Israelites were, were in trouble and the Midianites had a great military advantage. Verse 6, so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And so this time, once again, see what happens? We, we've seen the apostasy, the, the children of Israel have turned away from God and now they've been brought into servitude for a period of seven years. Now they've had enough of it and we get to the, the third part of this cycle down to supplication or to prayer. And the people begin to cry out to God, asking God to deliver them. And then God is getting ready to bring a judge by the name of Gideon that's going to help bring them to the point of, of salvation. But first what he does is he ends up bringing in an unnamed prophet. Now, in the entire book of Judges, there's only two prophets that are mentioned. One of them is a prophetess, and that's Deborah. This is the only other prophet, and what's interesting is this particular prophet isn't even named. He comes in with a message, and he reminds the Israelites of everything that God had done for them. He reminds them of God's deliverance from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, how he took care of them in the wilderness, the crossing of the Jordan River. He reminds them of God's goodness so that they would remember the God that they had turned their back on. And God had also commanded his people not to fear the false gods of the nations. But the people didn't listen. 
and they began to compromise. And I got to say, even us as a nation today, you know, we've got the one true God who has blessed us so very much over our entire history. And yet we live in a world that says the door is wide. You can come to God any which way you want. All you have to do is die. And so many people are, are buying into that. But what we need to remember is our Bible tells us in Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Well, in verse 11, it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in, in Orphra, or, excuse me, Ophra, which belonged to Joash the Abuzite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide from the Midianites. So there's a couple of things to see here in this particular passage. The angel of the Lord came. The tree that he sat underneath was a terebinth tree, which, by the way, is often confused with the oak tree today. And the oak tree and the terebinth tree can go somewhere in the area of 25 feet high. And as you look at the picture on the screen, you'll see that it gives a, a lot of shade. It gives a, a good place to hide, to, to go under, underneath that. And uh, we, we also see here that, that uh, it, this belonged to Joash the Ab Ab Abizite. I can't say the name. Abizite. <laughs> we'll get it one of these days. But that's Gideon's father. It's Gideon's father. Gideon threshed the wheat in a wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. Now, normally when the threshing would go on, what would happen is each town would have a threshing floor that would be located somewhere around the outside of the town. That threshing floor was either made up of rock, or if they didn't have rock, what they would do is they would take the dirt in that area and they would just pound it down to the point in which that dirt got, got really, really tough. Well, threshing was the process of separating the grain from the wheat, and, or the grain of the wheat, from the useless outer shell that we call chaff. In fact, what would happen is that the farmers would end up walking their animals over the floor with slush, or threshing sludges that cracked the wheat, the outer shell, and then what they would do is they would use winnowing forks to cast the wheat up into the air. The heavier grain would fall to the ground where it could be collected, and the shaft would blow out of the way. And Jesus uses that same illustration. In fact, we see John the Baptist talking about Jesus, and what he ends up saying is he's got his winnowing fork in his hand when it's talking about the final judgment. And he's going to throw it up, and the, the shaft's going to be, be blown off, and the shaft's going to be burned by fire as the wheat ends up falling to the ground. And you see that imagery that's, that's given there. Well, verse 11 illustrates the, the desperate situation that the Israelites were in. Did you notice where it was that Gideon was threshing? He wasn't out in the open field or at the end of the town where the Midianites who were all over the place on the hills around could see what was going on. What he did is he went under that terebinth tree to a wine press that was under there and got inside it. Now, what, what is a wine press? Well, it's a place that you make wine. But in those days, what they would do is they would, have, they would be square or they would be circular and they would be carved into a rock in which the wine could be collected as the people ended up walk, walking on it. But with a little bit of food that Gideon had left, he didn't want any chance of anyone around seeing. So he took the chance of taking that smaller amount of, of wheat to be able to hang on to that because that was all that he had. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And he said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I've got to think Gideon must have felt like a mighty man of valor. He's kind of cowering there and he's working in that wine press. And this angel comes in there and just underneath the tree and sees him. And he says, the Lord's with you, you mighty man of valor. I wonder how many times we think we can't do a particular ministry that God has called us to because we're unworthy. Or we can't do that particular ministry because maybe we're not gifted to do it. But I got to tell you, if God has called you to do a ministry, he will gift you so that you can do that ministry. And if he, if he asks you to do it, he'll be there with you to see you through. But I think it's significant as well that God saw Gideon as to what he would become, not so much what he was. You look at yourself today. And where you are today, do you realize that, that today is the first day for the rest of your life? It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You may have messed up big time in the past, but today you can turn it around. 
Today is the first day of the rest of your life. What kind of a legacy do you want to leave for your children? What kind of a legacy do you want to leave for your grandchildren? Oh, he was a good guy. He didn't know the Lord. Or are they calling you? Is God calling you to go out there and do things that you never dreamt that you would be able to do in him? And so the angel of the Lord comes, begins to talk to him, talks to him, oh, mighty man of valor. And immediately Gideon begins to question why. And, and, and God, you're saying I'm a mighty man of valor. Why is all this happening to me? Lord, I can't hardly even keep the food here. Every time we put it out in the open, it gets stolen. You look around, look at the enemy all over the place. Why is this happening? Why aren't we seeing the miracles that our fathers saw when we left Egypt, when we walked across the wilderness, when we came into the, the land? Why? And I have to wonder. <laughs> I have to think, God says something like, well, Gideon, why don't you take a look at your own family first? That's where it starts. And we're going to see that his family were Baal worshippers. His family had walked away. We don't know that Gideon did that, but we know that, that his family had walked away from the Lord. Verse 14, then the Lord turned to him. Notice the change. It's the angel of the Lord up to this point now. All of a sudden, it says, then the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, turned to him. The word Lord with capitals is that covenant name of God with Israel, the name Yahweh. And Yahweh turned to him. And he said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Well, this would require Gideon trusting God. And sometimes God says to us, go. We say, well, I can't do that. I'm not able to do that. I'm always looking for good definitions on faith. And I found this one from Warren Wiersbe. Faith means obeying God in spite of what we see how we feel, or what consequences there might be. I got to tell you, Gideon was not there yet. But I want to ask you about yourself with your situation that you're going through right now. I mean, you're struggling in different areas, maybe of your job, maybe family relationships, maybe if you should move or not, or whatever. But faith means obeying God in spite of what we see, how we feel, maybe you're afraid, or what the consequences might be. We move forward. Well, there's two other Old Testament figures that, that also made excuses. One of them we find in Exodus chapter 3. Remember Moses? God ends up calling Moses there at the burning bush. And as he does, he's getting ready to send Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to go, I want you to go home. I want you to go back to Pharaoh's house. And Moses says, whoa, wait a minute. You must be making a mistake here. You can't be talking to me. Uh, God, I, I can't speak. I stutter. I, I can't do it. God, why, why don't you bring my brother Aaron? Let, let Aaron do the speaking for me. And remember, as that went on and on, God got angrier and angrier. But then finally, Moses ended up going, but he lost part of the blessing because what he would have done, some of that Aaron was now doing. Well, there was a second person in the Bible as well, another really great individual by the name of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is called into ministry and God says, Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, I had plans for you. You know, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go and speak. And Jeremiah says, whoa, wait a minute. I'm a young man. I can't speak. God says, if I told you to go, I'll be with you as you go. And so both of them are saying, whoa, no, no, I, I can't do that. But now we got a third biblical figure here in verse 15. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, when you hear that, you're thinking, well, maybe he's the youngest in his father's house. Maybe he's not the strongest fighter in his father's house. But I think it's really possible that there was another reason in all of that as well. Wearsby says, Gideon's family worshiped Baal, Judges 6, 25 through 35. Although we have no reason to believe that Gideon joined them. When Gideon called himself the least of my father's house, he may have been suggesting that his family treated him like an outcast because he didn't worship Baal. Have you ever been in a situation with your family where you've, you've just questioned, I don't want to offend my family. I, I, I don't want to offend my, 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 my friends. 
And you look here and you find out that Gideon's family worshiped Baal. In fact, we're going to find out that his father hosted the altar of Baal at his house. And perhaps that's why he was looked down upon, but he was a man who would stand with the Lord. Verse 16, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you and shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Notice how as Gideon is struggling, immediately the Lord begins to answer the insecurities that he had. And he's telling him, You go out there and I will be with you. And you think, man, it'd be great to hear something like that, God telling us that in our struggles in life that he, he would be with us. But do you realize that we do have something like that within the scriptures? In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, it says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen? Amen. When you're going through your struggles in life and people are coming at you from all angles, you just remember the truth of that so that we can say together that what can man do to me? The Lord's already promised. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And if I'm walking in holiness, if I'm walking in his will, he has got my back 100% as we're going forward. Well, God gave Gideon his word. And yet even with that, Gideon wasn't, wasn't convinced, and, and he asked them for a sign. And I wonder if we're guilty of doing the same thing today, is we, we, we read God's word and we see the promises. In fact, uh, you, you can actually look, look on CBD or, or Amazon.com, and there's a book called The Bible Promise Book. And that book's got all the promises in the Bible that are listed out. And you can look through and you can see those promises. But even though we see the promises in the word of God, I wonder if we take God at his word. I wonder if we think, well, he could do it for them, but for me, I, I don't know. And yet we should be trusting God in the promises that he's given to us. You see, when Gideon began to question the Lord here, the Lord could have got really angry, but he didn't. And so we see that what Gideon wanted to do is he wanted to give the angel of the Lord here, or the Lord, a very special gift. In fact, during a time of famine, during a time in which he was doing everything he could to hide his food, what we find is that Gideon wanted to offer the Lord a significant food offering. Seven years of famine had been there, but we find out in verse 19 it says, so Gideon went in and he prepared a young goat. He prepared unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat was put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and he brought them out to him under the terab terabinth tree and he presented them. I think it's significant to realize that when food was scarce, Gideon stepped forward in faith and he took that young goat. He ended up taking the flour. It was a significant amount of flour. In fact, an ephah of flour was two-thirds of a bushel, somewhere in the area, 20 to 30 pounds that he ended up offering to the Lord. Verse 20, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock, pour out the broth. And he did so. And so as he comes, and he comes to this rock, a makeshift altar, if you would, and he puts everything on top. The angel of the Lord took his staff, reached out, and touched the offering. And all of a sudden, from within the rock, the fire came up, and the offering was completely consumed, so it was gone. Gideon turns, and he looks at the angel, angel of the Lord, and all of a sudden... He's gone, out of there. And then he's terrified. He's like, oh man, I can't believe this. I saw the Lord. I, I, I'm, so, I'm so in trouble. I, I, I'm a dead man. Why would he be thinking that he was a dead man? I think because Gideon was thinking back to what had happened with Moses in Exodus chapter 33. Do you remember back in those days, Moses wanted to see the glory of God? God, show me your glory. And God said, hey, I can't show you your glory. In fact, we, or my glory. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 19 through 20, he said this, then, then he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. In other words, God is so holy that in all of his glory, we can't look at him. Because if we do, we'll be consumed and we're dead men. Gideon has seen a form of God. 
He thought, man, I'm dead. That's going to apply to me. I am in so much trouble. What am I going to do with all of this? And then in verse 23, it says, The Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Gideon understood that God had indeed spoken to him. And he was terrified. And at that moment, God told him exactly what he needed. And he said, look, relax. Peace be with you. Do not fear. Do you realize those words are some of the most repeated words in Scripture? Do not fear. And I think it's because it's something that we need to hear. I think today many people long for all kinds of peace. I mean, we can want peace from conflicts we're in. We can want peace from wars that we're dealing with. But the ultimate peace that we need today is peace with God. Because that's the only peace that counts for eternity. And the only way that you and I can have peace with God today is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ as we come and we trust him. The Bible, as I said, says, nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to, to the Father except through me. In Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you found that kind of peace today? Because that's the only peace that's really going to count for the long run. Verses 25 through 26. Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull, here we go, of seven years. And that second bull, it just, there, was, there was two bulls. And he, God is just telling him, this is the bull you need to take. You need to take the seven one, second one that's seven years old. And tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut the wooden image that's beside it. And build an altar to the Lord, to Yahweh your God, on top of this rock in a, in a proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt offering with wood of the image which you shall cut down. You say, oh, that's not too bad of a test. Okay, now that God has empowered him, he's sending him out on a mission. And all he has to do is he needs to go over here and he needs to take down this altar of Baal. He needs to take down this Asherah pole. In fact, the Asherah pole here uh, is, is the Canaanite goddess of fertility that was right beside it. Take down that Asherah pole, cut the pole in pieces, use it for fuel, and burn it up. No problem, right? Until you realize that your father is the priest of Baal. And your father has the altar of Baal and the Asherah pole on his property. And you now had to turn against your family and your friends. Have you ever been afraid of doing something like that? You know, in my family, we don't have any, any other believers in my immediate family, extended family. And I'll tell you, they think I'm nuts. Sometimes I have to take stands that they think I'm absolutely nuts. They think I'm a religious fanatic. I'm a religious freak. But here's Gideon now with a, an entire family of Baal worshipers. He's stepping in and he's going to go ahead and he's going to destroy that. And he's going to replace it with an altar to Yahweh, which is exactly what he ends up doing. Bible Knowledge Commentary says the Lord gave Gideon the test of obedience. If Gideon was to deliver Israel from the Midianites, he must not only achieve military victory over the enemy, but also must remove the cause of idolatry, which initially led the Lord to give his people over to the Midianites. Verse 1. Therefore God commanded Gideon to destroy his father's altar to Baal and its accompanying Asherah pole. And Gideon was then to construct the proper kind of altar to the Lord. Gideon was put in a position, Gideon, you want to follow me? You're going to have to choose between family and friends. Have you ever been there in your walk with the Lord? Well, remember earlier on, Gideon had made excuses, you know, acting like he didn't have a whole lot. In fact, in verse 27, it says, So Gideon took ten men from among his servants, and he did as the Lord had said. Gideon said, oh, wait a minute, Lord, I, I'm from the smallest group group, a smallest clan in the tribe of Manasseh, and, and the, I'm the weakest, and we, we, we don't have all of this stuff. And yet now it's saying that when Gideon finally did obey the Lord, what did he do? He took 10 of his servants. How many of you have 10 servants in your house? He had some sustenance in that sense, and he ends up bringing them along with him. So he took them. But because he feared his father's household, the men of the city too, uh, the men, and the men of the city too, uh, much to do, uh, he ended up doing it by night instead of by day. In other words, Gideon obeyed the Lord, sort of. 
But uh, he ended up doing it at night because he was afraid of, of what others would think, how, maybe how others would react. And so he went ahead and he did it. You see, God was giving Gideon a test. And I think it's really important for us to understand because God won't fully use us for his kingdom until we tear down the idols in our lives. You know, what are those idols? For some of you, it may be your job. That's everything in your life. For some of you, it may be sports. I imagine some of you are saying, I wish you'd hurry up and stop the sermon so I can go home and watch some football today. <laughs> it could be any number of things. For some of you, it could be money. An idol is anything that is elevated in your life above your relationship with God. And if God is going to fully use you, that idol needs to come crashing down. And the altar to the Lord needs to come up. And so that had to happen first. It's worth noting that the true believers can't build an altar to the Lord unless they first tear down the altars they've built to the false gods that they worship. Our God is a jealous God and will not share his glory or our love with another. Well, needless to say, in the morning, early in the morning, the guys got up at the town. The men began going over by the altar in order to worship. And they got over there. And what did they find? The altar was destroyed. The Asherah pole was destroyed. And in its place was an altar to Yahweh, which had been raised up. And they were absolutely furious. They were so furious, they wanted to kill Gideon for the crime in which he had committed. And yet they were the ones who had done wrong. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 4 through 6 says, For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But here you go. Listen to this. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. Gideon had done exactly what the word of God said to do. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. I think the frightening thing here is the men of this town, Jewish men, had somehow turned away from the Lord. And not only had they turned away from the Lord, they'd, they'd compromised. They, they, they entered into to Baal worship. And what they should have been doing, they totally flipped on its head. They were doing the exact opposite. In fact, Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 through 8 continues. It says this. It says, if, you're, if your brother, the son of your mother, the son of your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far away from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or even listen to him, nor shall you I pity, nor shall, show, show your eye pity him, nor shall you, shall you spare him or conceal him. But here it comes in verse 10, Deuteronomy 13, 9 and 10. But you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first to put him to death. And afterward, the hand of all of the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies because you sought to entice. He sought to entice you away from the Lord your God. You know, here they are. Gideon comes in. He did exactly what the word of God said. And these people are pointing their fingers at him. They are furious at him. They want to execute him for that which he did. But when they've got one finger pointed at Gideon, They've got three fingers pointed at themselves that they violated God's word and Gideon did exactly what he was supposed to do. We're seeing the same thing in our country today, folks. You know, I mean, everything seems to be flipped upside down. Have you noticed that? In Gideon's day, they had taken what was good and turned it to evil and what was evil and turned it to good. And in our own day, we see that people are taking what is good and turn it to evil and what is evil and, and turning it to good. And I'll tell you, it's just heartbreaking to see what's, what's happening. And in both cases, there was little love for the one true God. But notice what happens in this when Gideon takes his stand, because all of a sudden there's this major change that takes place in his father, who's the priest of Baal. 
In verse 31 it says, But Joash, that's Gideon's father, But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he's God, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. So Joash all of a sudden changes. He says, well, wait a minute. If, if in fact Baal was God, then this should have never happened with Gideon coming and tearing down the, uh, his altar. Let, let him deal with it. If he's really God, let him deal with it. And we see another major, major character, major personality in the Bible who also goes out and also ends up mocking Baal. You remember up on Mount Carmel when Elijah's up there and he's, he's battling with the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 uh, prophets of Asherah as well. And he's got this battle going on up there. And, and from 9 o'clock until noon, all of the people, he lets the prophets of Baal go first. They're jumping all over the place. They're trying to get them to bring fire down from heaven. Nothing's happening. And so Elijah starts messing around with them. And it says, so it was at noon that Elijah marked them. And he said to him, cry aloud. He's a god. He should be able to take care of this. Well, maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's mm, out there thinking about something. Or maybe he's busy. Do you know how big of a mock this is? Do you know what that word busy in the Hebrew means? Maybe he's going to the bathroom. You know, he's, he's really getting on him. Or, or maybe he's on a journey. Or may, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's being awake. And we see that Elijah does the same thing, mocking him before God comes and does this incredible thing. Fire falls from heaven and all of these prophets of, of Baal are killed and destroyed. Well, verses... Verse 32 says, therefore on that day he called him, meaning his father called him, Jerubabel. Let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. Gideon, er, Gideon goes through a name change. He's now Jerubabel. You think, well, so what's the big deal? Why, why the name change? Well, actually, there's a lot in a name change. And what we find out here is that Gideon's father ends up changing his name as a perpetual slap in the face to Baal and to Baal's followers, reminding all of them of the impotence of this false god every time they called out the name Jerubabel. Well, Gideon had passed his first test, but now a much more dangerous second threat was coming. And in verses 33 through 34 said, Then all of the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east gathered together, and they crossed over and they encamped in the valley of Jezreel. That's the valley that, that Elijah pulled up his garments and, and he, he ran way ahead of King, King uh, Ahab. And so in that particular valley, this is where this has taken place, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And he blew the trumpet, and the Abizrites gathered behind him. Now, who were these people? This is significant. That was his hometown. One man taking a stand for the biblical God changed the whole hometown so that they began to follow after him. And they ended up leading the way in all of this. But the imminent threat that they were facing was 135 Midianites who had worked their way into the valley of Jezreel. Now, we look at this valley, and I've had opportunity to stand at that spot on top of Mount Hermon and look down. But that's the valley that we see, which is also known as Har Megiddo. Anybody know what's going to take place at Har Megiddo? That's the Battle of Armageddon. And this is the whole valley here that we see that, that's so symbolic of that final battle in Israel. Maybe, maybe literal to a point, but you can see the size of it. It's not all that big there. But uh, uh, down in that valley, it was filled like locusts with 135,000 soldiers. And not only were there 135,000 soldiers, but the enemy army was using a new tactical weapon. And that weapon that gave them such an advantage was camels. But ladies and gentlemen, with God, all things are possible. Amen? So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he stepped to the front to take the lead. Notice that when the Spirit came upon him, then all of a sudden he was empowered to do that which God had called him to do. And I have to wonder for ourselves, we're going to go through tough times as, as well. And when those times end up getting tough with us, I wonder how many of us are going to actually end up standing for our faith. One of the concerns I have is, I think we have three years, maybe a little bit more, before things get incredibly tough in this country. 
Right now, our country is cut right down in the middle. There is so much division in this country, it is horrible. We've never had to face severe persecution in this country, but it's very possible that in the future, that persecution will be coming our direction. As Christians, as evangelical Christians, and I've got to ask you, are you going to take a stand for Christ? Are you going to take a stand for Scripture? Or are you going to back off and do it the easy way so that we just get through that time? But maybe it's something like this that's going to be needed in order to wake up the church, the body of Christ, to be the church, to do the things that God has called us to do. Church Father Tertullian said this, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Did you catch that? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. If you want the church to grow, the church has to go through tough times. The blood of the martyrs, the, our English word witness. Do you want to know what the Greek word for that is? Martyria. <laughs> Martyria. What's that sound like? Martyr. If you're going to be a witness for Christ, you may end up being a martyr. And we just need to, to realize that. But how will you react when you're targeted for your faith? I just want to encourage you with the words from Romans 8, 31b, which says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You see, imminent danger has a way of rallying the people of God. And Israel knew what would happen. They'd already been through it seven different times. They were, they were destitute. They did not want to go through it again. That common threat united them together. And I have to wonder for ourselves if the day is coming when a common threat will once again take a splinter nation and bring that nation together and unite us again. Verse 35, and he, meaning Gideon, sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. And he sent messengers to Asher and to Zebulon and to Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. And so when Gideon set out the message, what's interesting is just four tribes responded, Manasseh, Zebulon, Asher, Naphtali. I wonder about Issachar and why, why they didn't get going in this since they were involved in it. But, but from those four tribes, 32,000 soldiers responded. That sounds pretty good until you realize that down below them in the valley of Jezreel, there were 135,000 enemy soldiers that were there. Gideon must have been thinking, this doesn't look like a fair fight to me. Verse 36, then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you, as you said, look, I, I'm going to put out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and the ground is dry, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. You've said, as you've said. <laughs> Gideon's already been promised by God that he's going to be used by him to be the deliverer of Israel. But he's afraid. Why would he be afraid? Well, think about it. 32,000 soldiers here. 135,000 soldiers here. And you know what the rest of the story is too. And we're going to be getting to that in, in, in a future week here. But he puts out this fleece to test God's will. Should we be doing that? I'll tell you what, Christians put out fleece all the time to see if this is within God's will. And is that something that we should do? Verse 38. And it was so that when Gideon rose early the next morning and he squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece and a whole bowl full of water ended up being filled with water. So Gideon does that. But you've got to believe that putting out the fleece, rather than demonstrating Gideon's faith in God, actually demonstrated his lack of faith and his lack of trust in God and his word. William MacDonald says, Gideon was not looking to, to the fleece for guidance, but for confirmation. God had already told him what he was to do. Gideon was just seeking assurance of the success. In other words, he wasn't asking God, what, what's your will? He already knew what God's will is. God had told him. But what he was saying is, God, will you give me that assurance that when I take on these 135,000 people that, that, that I'm going to win, that I'm, I'm doing the, the right thing? Verse 39. And then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just one more time. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece. But on the ground, let there be dew. And so there's a second test that Gideon does. Now, 
What I want to bring up here, I think it's so important that when we look at the heroes of the faith, we tend to think these guys were superheroes. You know, that's, that's why they're in the Bible, and we're not. They were superheroes. I think it's important that for us to see the weaknesses of the people who are in the Bible. And that's one of the things I love about the scriptures. It's transparent, that we can see what they struggle with, and then we can apply those struggles even to our own life. Gideon doubted, and there was times in which he had fear. But this time, Gideon makes the request a little more difficult. And you have to wonder, did he think that maybe the first test could have been fulfilled by natural means? So I'm going to see if we can go ahead and switch it over and, and, and see if, if it's for God for sure because of his fears. But notice what Gideon says. Gideon says to God as he's doing it, God, don't, don't be angry with me. Why would Gideon say, don't be angry with me? Because he knew what he was doing was wrong. How would he know that? In Deuteronomy, we see Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 17. We see it says that you shall not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Massa. And you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies, his statutes, with which he has commanded you. We think back to that particular passage in Deuteronomy and what had happened is the Israelites hadn't had any water and the people were complaining against Moses at Massa. And it was there that God told him to strike the rock once and that the water would flow out. But we see that the commandment was on there, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massa. And here Gideon realized that he was, he was tempting him because he was testing him. But I have to wonder, are we guilty of doing the same thing? We know many times what God wants us to do from his word. But then we'll throw that fleece out there to see if that's really what he, what he, what he means. Well, I, I, I'd kind of like to have this job over here, and I've got two jobs that I'm looking at. So I think what I'm going to see, if, if this job here calls me between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m. in the afternoon, then I know that this is God's will. Is that throwing out the fleece, you know? Or um, maybe you look at another point and, and you realize from God's word that each and every one of us should use every opportunity that we have to witness to people for Christ. But you're nervous about it. And so just to make sure, you know somebody might be in a certain location at a particular time. And so you say, okay, God, if it's your will, I'm going to go to this location at two o'clock in the afternoon. And if so-and-so is here, then I know that it's your will for me to witness to him. Do we do that kind of stuff today even? I think so when we know in the word of God that we're to take advantage of every opportunity. We, we know what God's word is and what his will is. Well, once again, God in his grace responded to Gideon's request. And in verse 40, it says, God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all of the ground. So putting out the fleece shouldn't be the norm for Christians. See, throwing out the fleece, it's not a good way to find out the will of God. Trusting God, trusting his word, and making wise decisions is. Amen? If you want to know what to do in life, you go to the word of God. You see how it's laid out. You trust in God. You trust his word. And then put it together with wisdom, with the counsel you have, and make wise decisions. Perhaps some of you are struggling a little bit right now and, and wondering, what's the will of God for me in my life? And yet we find that the scripture reveals God's will in three different ways. The first is God's sovereign or his hidden will. It's also known as God's decretive will. It's a, a decree from God. And people say, well, I, I want to know what's going to happen in the future. You can't know what's going to happen in the future because that's part of God's sovereign will or part of his hidden will in, what, in, in which whatsoever comes to pass that God would desire to come to pass. Now, we need to be careful to say that God is not the author of evil, although at times he will allow evil to come in to ultimately meet his purpose, and somehow, in the end, it brings us more, more glory to him. But the second part of God's will is God's preceptive will, also known as God's moral will. Well, you say, okay, all these big words, I, I, I don't get it. What is God's preceptive will? Are you ready for this? God's preceptive will is the precepts of the Bible. God's moral will is what the Bible says, what is right and wrong. This we can know. We can't know God's sovereign will, 
But this we can know what the Bible says. And so if you want to know how to handle a situation, should I marry somebody who's not a Christian? You go to the Bible and it says, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be equally unequally yoked. Should I go out there and uh, steal on my income taxes? No, you shouldn't go out there and steal on your income taxes because the Bible says we shouldn't steal. The Bible says we shouldn't murder. The Bible says we shouldn't commit adultery. And as we go on down the list and, and all of the, uh, the teachings in Scripture, we can know what's right and wrong. Well, you might be saying, well, what about the last one? What about number three, God's will of disposition? I'm, I'm not sure that I understand that. God's will of disposition is what pleases God. It pleases God when we walk in holiness. It pleases God when we walk in obedience. In fact, the Bible tells us that if we're obedient, God will bless us. If we're disobedient, God will curse us. We'll go through difficult times. And we see that God's will of disposition is what pleases God and what doesn't please God. Now, so many Christians just struggle all the time with knowing the will of God. What should I do? And, and so many end up thinking that, that we've got to hit the bullseye in order for us to, to be happy. We've got to be right in the bullseye of God's will or things aren't going to work right. Maybe the biggest example of this was in your marriage. There's seven and a half billion people in the world and I have to find that one person in the world who's God's perfect choice for me. Or you've got several options at a job or places to live. I've got to find that one place or that one job or I'm never going to be happy. I'm always going to be miserable. I'm always going to end up fighting. Well, I got to tell you, here's the standard, ladies and gentlemen, right here. And I like to use this example. You know, when you're watching TV at home, when you're watching a movie at home, and you're wondering, should I be watching this or should I not be watching this? What I like to say is if Jesus were sitting on that couch or that chair beside you, would you be watching the show that you're watching right now? And if the answer is no, then you probably know pretty clearly that you shouldn't be watching that show. Or how about this? How, how about the job you end up taking? If Jesus were standing beside me in the job in which I am now working, would, would he approve of what I'm doing? And if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't be doing that. But what takes so much pressure off of you, and this is what's really helped me over the years, is realizing what the Word of God says. If you take the moral law of God and realize that we don't have to worry about hitting that bullseye. The moral law of God is much bigger, much bigger. And so within that big circle, and you're looking for somebody to marry, as, uh, there may be a whole bunch of candidates in here in which fit within that category. But here's the will of God. If it fits within the category of the, of, of the word of God, who do you want to marry? If it's with jobs and you look at, at what job to take or, or places to live, what place to live, and it fits within the will of God, what job do you want? What job would you really like to be a part of? Or where do you want to live? And all of these options are open. And I think so many of us end up getting into a huff with God that we have got to find the bullseye. And we spend time so frustrated in life because we're... We're chasing after a dream that we can never be sure of. I just want to encourage you, use your scriptures. Spend time daily. Get to know God. And whatever questions you're looking at, uh, just, just choose something that will honor and glorify him. Well, where do you feel the Spirit's leading you? Once you're sure it's okay with God's moral law, step forward in faith and follow your dreams. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for examples like Gideon as we see the fear that he faced and the fear that by your spirit that he conquered. I pray, Lord, for each and every person who's here today. I, I know in a, a crowd decides that there's probably several people that are making major decisions in their life. And I pray that as they take those decisions and they compare them to, to your word, that they would come to realize that there's several choices that they can make that would be honoring you of you. And Lord, that you would just lead them to the right one, to the right decision. But Father, the biggest decision in life is coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone here today that's never received Christ, Lord, I pray that not another day go by without that happening, that they wouldn't leave here today without making that commitment. Lord, maybe they pray a prayer like this, just realizing it's not the words of the prayer that save, but the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God. 
I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I ask, Lord, that you would come into my heart and my life and help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Lord, I repent. I change direction this day. And I receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lead me to the cross.